Vinay Prasad back on the show. It's great to be back. I love it because I know that like just even having you on just just juices up the antagonism on Twitter. <laughs> good, good. I'm right, glad, right. Glad, uh, glad to, glad to get the clicks. Oh, no. yeah, that's what we're all about. <laughs> that's is, what we're all about. We see, and people accuse us of this. Actually, it's like you're contrarians because you know it's like you're captured by your audience and you know they love that and you just want the clicks, bro. It's like no, we're contrarians because well, first of all, we're not contrarians, right? I don't view that like, way. Yeah, ninety percent of what we think plus is mainstream. <laughs> Well, I would say one more thing about that. I was like, you know, somebody somebody pointed this out to me, some, a colleague of mine, and he said, you know, um, people act as if your views are new or novel. And they're like, if you go back and you read my book, Ending Medical Reversal, and you read every paper I've published from 2009 to the present day, you'll see a very consistent philosophical viewpoint, which is one – Human beings often do things that they think make the world better. Most of those things actually don't work. A small subset of them do work. The way to separate those is really well-done studies. Um, when you jump ahead of evidence, when you get ahead of evidence based on hope and optimism, you often make a mistake. That's the whole theme of ethical medical reversal. And that's a lot of what I've been saying throughout this pandemic. It's been very consistent. And the thing is what you point at is this idea that emotion blinds us as humans or belief or ideology, whatever it is. And there's a good example of this. So this morning I got, I get a lot of hate mail, but occasionally one really piques my interest. So this one was like, hey, when um, these mandates happen for kids and you're to blame for it, I'm like, wait, what? Did I ever say what I thought you were yeah. critical of the no, mandate. No, but it doesn't matter because, I, because I'm pro-vaccine. <laughs> I see. That's all it takes because his ideology was triggered. He says, I hope you commit suicide really? because the world will be better with you dead. Wow. And so I looked at that and I was like, this is interesting. This guy really thinks he's right. Like he's doing good in the world by sending this email. He believes it deeply to to whatever evidence you were to show. It's like, well, you didn't even watch the show where I talked about man. So it is interesting. People are driven now by this kind of broken brain thing, which we're going to talk about in the well, show. Well, somebody told me like, you know, um, I don't know why you defended ivermectin. I was like, me? I was like, I took the biggest <laughs> crap on it. Ever. I was like, I was very critical of it. Talk about hate mail. Yeah, yeah. I was like, at least get my like position correct when you hate on me. Um, <laughs> but of course I was very, uh, tr I tried to preserve the equipoise to run the randomized study. Um, but you know, what you're saying reminds me of something Bill Maher was saying in his uh, show, yeah. which is that, you know, he asks the audience uh, and his audience, of course, left to center. What should we do with the people who enabled Trump, who allowed this kind of stuff to happen? And he says, you know, one out of every two shows he does, somebody in the audience shouts out, kill them oh, and he points out man. that this is a bad place we're getting to yeah. as a society where you don't just disagree with someone you want them dead like this person was like wishes you to be dead yeah. that's I don't know what to say. That's very bad. I, I mean, that's dangerous. I think it digs right into that coddling of the American mind thing where you actually view ideas that fundamentally challenge your unconscious or conscious ideology and beliefs as evil. Yeah. Like this is a danger to the world. Like words are violence, right? It's like you write anything on Substack, there's 30,000 people on Twitter who are ready to call you an evil person who's dangerous. Right? It's so funny that like the people who have habitually disagreed with me are the most ardent followers of my Substack post. <laughs> They're, they're the ones who are reading all the way to line number 72 and you know, it's 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 so it's such a theater. I mean, let's be honest, what, what's going on? You know, some people disagree with some people on some issues, and then they go around looking for something that they can complain about and create some sort of uh, anger mob about. And that's what, it's happening everywhere, all across society in every yeah. different space. And it's really kind of just sad behavior because I, I, I'm living in a, perhaps a bygone era, but you know what I like? Uh, you know what I like, Zubin? I like to hear ideas that I've never thought of. Yeah. I like to hear ideas that initially sound unpalatable to me, but over time, I think there might be some truth to that. I like to hear views that I agree with and views I disagree with. I like to have my thinking evolve. I think it's actually kind of fun. That's why I'm in the academy. That's why I tried to you know, do all this work because I enjoy the nature of discussing ideas. Who's left? Who still enjoys talking about things? People are very reluctant to talk about things, reluctant to talk about COVID, even at the hospital. People don't want to talk about COVID policy. People don't want to talk about, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, they're increasingly more and more subjects that are the third rail of American life. I think it really uh, digs into social media as the as the, one of the root issues here because it becomes a performance issue, a tribe issue. So we have all divided into these sub tribes, these little mimetic, like based on our idea, ideology. And then what we do is the goal is really rally that tribe and villainize whoever's not in that tribe. So if VP is outside of the tribe, then what the tribe, the other tribe will do is they will follow you on on Substack. They will read line by line and go, this is ridiculous. Then they'll find a few experts in their tribe and go, 
talk about this guy. And then they'll go back in time and they go, you remember in 1998 when as a as a student in elementary school, he said this. <laughs> and, and it's like, it's, it's like that kind of shit happens to me. Yeah. Like, you know, like someone will, will resurrect a tweet from like two years ago and be like, I always knew he was a bad person. Look what he said. And the tweet was something, well, yeah. it was something like uh, four out of five doctors agree Try to be the fifth doctor and always try to find holes in what's going on, right? Don't just swallow the group thing. No. Are you against consensus? <laughs> <laughs> You're against level one consensus. Are you a chiropractor? You know, like this kind of stuff. I'm like, But, you know, on. I mean, it's across American life. I, I was reading about some editor of some news magazine or something that no one wants to read. And this person was like fired for tweets that they wrote when they're like 16 or 17 or something like that. You know, I guess to some degree, we're fortunate to have come up in an age where there's no like permanent record of everything I ever said when I was 16 yeah. because no one should be held to that standard. But also like, I don't know, um, everything must be interpreted at like how things were at the time. Um, things are easily misinterpreted. Things are easily twisted. Uh, there's a whole group of people who won't quote, re- you know, review the security footage with your own eyes. You know, in other words, they just take as gospel what other people say the interpretation of the footage is and they don't actually review the primary source material. Yeah. Um, that, you know, that's fundamentally sort of anti-intellectual idea. Yeah, I think we're in that kind of in that kind of zone now. So, speaking of anti-intellectual, let's talk. What do you think? Should we do baby vaccines? Baby, meaning like <laughs> five to eleven. I consider them babies. Yeah, let's do it. It's in the news. It's in the news. FDA Verback Committee. Verback. Our boy Paul Offit on that committee uh, deliberated and said, "Hey, all right." Let's go ahead and say this is okay from a safety efficacy standpoint. Over to you, CDC, for the final, like, who do, who should get it? Yeah. What are your 17 one one abstention. Right. And the abstention was a dude, was it a guy from NIH, right? I, I think where so. he's from. Yeah. Uh, I did, yeah. Yeah. And why did he abstain? Do we know? He put out a little, um, a little summary of his reasons, but his reasons were, I think, uh, a, a few good reasons, actually. These were brought up during the panel discussion. One, um, I guess it's worth saying that, like, you know, I think every single member of that panel felt very strongly that we ought to make the pediatric vaccine available at this dose and this schedule for kids with comorbidities that put them at high risk of bad outcomes from SARS-CoV-2. Mm. I think that was where, like, everyone agreed on that. Yeah. Then the next question is, like, kids who don't have comorbidities that put them at high risk of SARS-CoV-2, there's at least two chunks there. There's kids who've never been exposed to the virus and kids who've already been exposed to the virus. This person's point was that, you know, current CDC estimates say that maybe 40% of kids Kids have already been exposed to the virus and clear the virus. Mm. And he was saying that the proposition that this vaccine will provide a net health benefit to those kids is a little bit more uncertain and likely smaller than the kids who've never been exposed, obviously, because they've exposed and recovered. They have some natural immunity. We right. can say it, right? Plus, now, we've kind of shown that they didn't die and they didn't get MISC and they didn't get yes. long COVID, presumably. Presumably. Yeah. And very plausibly, then the next 10 years, they will be reinfected with the virus with milder and milder every time they get reinfected illness because this is an endemic virus. Right. The like second, other coronaviruses. Like other coronaviruses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. The the second point he made was that we are wedding ourselves to this dosing schedule three weeks apart in this EUA action, and we already have some evidence from the adult data that the durability of those antibodies is going to be waning. Um, and his concern was that it'll be even worse in this group, and we'll be in a situation where you know we might be talking about a booster for a child six months from now, or two boosters or three boosters, and he thinks that you know there might be an opportunity to kind of do this a little bit differently now so that we can have more durable immunity. Right. And then I think one of his other points that he made verbally that he didn't put out in his typed statement was that, you know, we're talking about a vaccine construct based on a sequence of the virus that is now quite old. I mean, it's not the most current sequence of the virus. It's not the Delta strain sequence. And so he talked about what are the implications of vaccine against that. Um, I think those are sort of the central concerns. There are other panel members who brought up other concerns. Right. Um, but I think the, the group they're most concerned about are the healthy kids, no comorbidities, especially the group who've had and cleared it. But I think even to some degree, the group that have not yet had it, um, because, of course, the risk benefit proposition is going to be a little bit more uncertain and a little bit more tenuous a balance in that group, healthy kids. Right. And then looking at myocarditis as the main risk, we don't really even know the rate in young kids younger than 12, right? Because we just don't have enough numbers. I mean, the, the sample size of this study is... 3,200? Yeah, and I think it, it, it's like 15, 18 versus like uh, half, it's like a two to one randomization or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, um, it's not big enough to even find the highest estimate of myocarditis in 12 to 15. I mean, it's not big enough to even find events in the ballpark of one in 2K, one in 3K, one in right. 1K even to some degree. Right. Um, its sample size is too small to rule out safety events that occur with even 
considerable frequency. One in 5K, I think, is considerable. And so, yes, we have no idea. So they have models. In, I mean, part That's of the, right. yeah, this yeah. is the point I wanted to make to you. And this is the point I made on my Substack, which listeners should check out. Check <laughs> out line 72, where you compared <laughs> the vaccine to, you know, slavery. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> who knows what it says in there? <laughs> right. Um, I don't think it says that, but who knows no, what it, it says? No, it does not. It does not say that. Yeah. Um, so um, this, uh, the, the point I wanted to make here was, uh, what was the point I wanted to make here? Um <laughs> You, know, you were talking about in your Substack. You were talking about myocarditis and safety signal in the kids' study, which is small. Which is small. Oh, and yeah. then the modeling. And so yeah. I guess the point I wanted to make was the most persuasive case for emergency use authorization was a series of models presented by uh, FDA staffers showing that under a range of assumptions, um, it was very likely that this vaccine would confer net efficacy. Mm. Um, and what I thought was quite interesting was every single parameter that went in that model did not come from the current pivotal randomized control trial. Yeah, right. In other words, like the things that went in the model were, you know, if a kid gets sick with COVID, um, what's the chance to get hospitalized? Well, that's from population data. Mm -hmm. If uh, what's the chance a kid will get sick with COVID? That's from historical data. Um, if a kid gets the vaccine, what's the probability they'll get myocarditis? Well, that's from a different age group and it's from observational data. And they not a single parameter actually derives from the study for s approval. And so that creates a very interesting regulatory point that I think few people have pointed out that I tried to point out, which is that for somebody who was an ardent proponent that we really need to get this quickly and we really want and I want to give my kid this right away because I'm concerned about this, that person has a legitimate gr grounds to say, what took you so long? Mm. Why did you need this study? Because the entire model that supports approval that you're hanging your hat on, it's every parameter, done. it's already done. You had all those parameters months ago. You could have approved it based on the model months ago because the model is apparently what persuades you. Meanwhile, the other person out there who's a little more skittish, who wants more safety data, they want more information, that person will say, this trial is simply too small to give you any useful information. There's zero severe COVID. There's zero MISC. There's zero myocarditis in the trial because the sample size is too small. So why don't you wait until you get a bigger trial? So I see, you see, nobody is sated. The person who wanted it based on preliminary data, they could have had it months ago. The person who wants more data, they probably want a bigger study or they want some more population data. And that to me is very interesting from a regulatory perspective. Mm -hmm. There are not many instances in my mind where the case for regulatory action is made uh, predominantly, in my opinion, based on the modeling rather than the pivotal trial data. Usually it's the pivotal trial data that drives the, the registration. Yeah, and the modeling, of course, has so many different assumptions that you have to bake in. And like, is this delta level transmissibility? What's the prevalence in the community? And that will tip very easily from myocarditis Zubin, and harm. I thought all models this pandemic have been spot on. They've been pretty much. <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> yeah, Imperial College, all of them. Just right on the number. You, you quibble about a few decimal places, right? But these models have you know, all been spot on. You know what we should on. do? I've been wanting to do this. I've been wanting to go through all my videos yeah. and do a real doctor watches Oh, a yourself. supposedly real doctor talking about the pandemic and start in like t January of 2020 and just go, okay, yeah, that was right. That was right. You're off your, no, that was wrong. You're crazy. Oh my God, how deluded are you? You know, and just with the retrospectoscope, look back. And I bet if anybody did that to anything, you would find the same result, which is complete chaos. Oh, no one knew what was happening. Well, that's a really, first of all, that's a great idea. You shouldn't have just said it now because some- oh, you're, well, Now I'm gonna have to do it. I'll oh, do it. No, people are gonna scoop your idea. Oh, they're gonna do it. Yeah, they're well, let them do it, let them do it. Well, as long I guess as it's they, done. They, they, to be honest, we'll talk about this, but nobody on YouTube has a track record of even talking about the pandemic among doctors, right? There's, there's not the, <laughs> that doesn't even exist. Talking about medicine it's, among medicine on it's YouTube. It's kind of true. It kind of doesn't exist. Um, but I think it's fascinating. And um, uh, maybe I'll steal your idea, but here's how I would do it. I have a pinned tweet. My pinned tweet is every op-ed podcast uh, commentary I've done on the pandemic including the videos that you and I have done. And I, I, I wanna say, uh, I, I literally think that every single one of those things, like I, I, I stand by, I think, I, I think they really hold up. And I urge somebody to go through and read all those things and see what you think, if they hold up or not. I think we should do that. Because, because there, were, there are things I know, I'm like, man, that was right, that was right. And then there's stuff I've said where it's like, oh, you know, I think this thing's pretty much over and the, once the vaccine happens, it's like, oh, Delta happened. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, so at least you're honest. I, I always try to avoid uh, making any speculations about the future. But here are some of the things I think- Oh, we got, I do it constantly. We got right uh, way ahead of everybody. Um, allowing people to die alone is a criminal. Yeah, criminal, yeah. We, we were way ahead of everyone. When they were all panicking, we said that. We were right. We're gonna be vindicated. Yeah. Uh, to school closure. School that, closure. We were way ahead of everyone. You were even better than me because you brought on expert after expert after expert and you did your damnedest in the fall of 2020 to 
push that issue. Um, we were right about, I think, we, we had a very nuanced approach on masks. We weren't uh, zealots in either direction. I think that'll hold up. We weren't zealots on masking kids. Uh, and then the other place I think we're going to be vindicated greatly is that we are both consistently pro-vaccine, particularly adult vaccine. Yeah. We're also about honest conversations in younger ages. And we're also kind of skittish about the downstream consequences of mandates. And I think all those things will be borne out. Man, you just basically summarized the entire ethos of the show from and your show, and, and it's great. And by the way, I mean, if, folks, if you haven't seen Vinay's channel, he basically stole all the ideas I gave him <laughs> and basically is crushing it. Well, I, I have to admit, first of all, you were the one who, I give you all the credit because you were the one who pushed me to actually like commit to doing something on YouTube. And I did steal your stuff, which we'll talk about, which is that you and I are now, I think, the, we're like the only people who actually talk about like actually substantive medical issues um, and the days. Well, wait a minute. You, you you don't want to do a video on like what your day is like as a hemonk attending? <laughs> what I ate for breakfast and right, what right. car I drive. My and life as a med student renegade? <laughs> we'll talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But, but, no, no, no. But all, all joking aside, I actually literally watch your YouTube channel and go, okay, that's what I'm talking about today, but I'm going to dumb it down. <laughs> Because <laughs> I don't even understand it. Like you're just you're too smart for your own good sometimes. Know. You know? Well, well, the problem is you. This is your life's work. You, this is what you do. Regulatory science. Well, some yeah. of these issues are my life's some work. Of it, yeah. Other the issues I've been dragged in kicking and screaming. <laughs> like what? Like what's an issue that you? I really... mean, I, like uh, social policy in schools is not an issue that's in my yeah, wheelhouse yeah. naturally. Yeah. Um, and how did I get into it? I don't know. I guess I remember you know in the summer of 2020 distinctly. I remember when Trump said what he said. That he wanted them to reopen. Right. And I don't know, as a, any good progressive or liberal, my baseline understanding was that I thought schools had something to do with the quality of people we turn out in the society. You know, <laughs> I thought they had something to do with like an up a ladder of mobility. And I was shocked when my tribe, my progressive liberals were sort of vehemently against opening schools. And that led me to go down the rabbit hole of like read everything I could read and talk to Alistair Monroe from the UK and Vlad Kogan, a policy expert. And so, but I would say that like school policy, that wasn't in my wheelhouse. But vaccine approval, drug approval, the evidence for masking those are strictly in my wheelhouse like mm -hmm. that's that's the kind of stuff that i do mm -hmm. day in day out for 10 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. um school's a little bit different political yeah. ramifications a little bit different but i've been asked to comment about long stream consequences to science and stuff it's a, it's 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 crucial to the discourse that yeah. we have different voices talking about the stuff who are actually educated in the the stuff they're talking about and it doesn't mean that you have to be a, a pediatrician to talk about kids vaccines i don't think that's necessary it's nice you know that's why we get paul often yes. on the show and he has a very you know his stance is really interesting he's like life is full of risk so you have to decide, are you willing to take the risk of MISC, long COVID, COVID, and with a bat coronavirus out of Wuhan or whatever gain of function, we'll talk about that. Uh, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, the this very small risk of vaccine. Now, I, you know, his estimation of myocarditis risk may skew on the low side. Yeah, I think because he uses the denominator that's not appropriate. He's not using the, the uh, boys in that age group, 16, right, 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 right. I know. Okay. The very specific. Yes, the yeah, very specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, I mean, medicine is personalized. So like, you know, I, I'll tell you what, you tend to know on average if your patient is a 16-year-old boy versus a 42-year-old uh, woman. I mean, yeah. you, that's something yeah. you know. And yeah. so if you know that, you should leverage that for your analysis, I think. <laughs> um, but, Come on, kids are just little adults. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I'll say one thing about this pediatrician thing. You know, yeah. one of the things I wrote was the Atlantic article where I pointed out that the evidence for masking kids to through whatever was like totally lacking. And it's totally lacking. And it was, it's going to be a great pandemic failure that we never ran any cluster studies. Um, but one of the pushbacks I got was like, why are you letting this, you know, not pediatrician um, comment in the Atlantic? You know, it's all about platforming these days, this kind of rhetoric. Uh, why are you letting me even write this article right. and then you know alistair monroe from the uk he pointed out i think nicely on twitter that he was like you do know that like pretty much this guy's thinking is like in line with like every single pediatric expert on this topic in the united kingdom <laughs> you know like <laughs> like the, you know it's well, kind of in line with half of western europe well that's the thing we seem to ignore the european experience as valid in the United States. You know, it's strange to me, like as a liberal, like all these years we're always like, oh, Medicare for all, a single payer. And, and those are things that I like, I'm like on the side of like universal healthcare, et cetera. Um, and where do we get their model? Like, who do we point to? We point to look at Germany, look at Sweden, look at a good job they have with their, their nationalized healthcare. Look how good they're containing costs. And now in the pandemic, when it comes to policies around children, we ignore them. We act like they don't exist. We act like Sweden wants to murder their population. Right. It's it's really a cognitive dissonance I've never seen. It's a belief uh, based ideology. Again, it's that same thing that was, came with that you know email. Go kill yourself. It's the same thing. It's like your the your ideology does not vibe with mine right now or my tribes. More importantly, because if we were in isolation, first of all, we would fall apart because we're social creatures. So 
in the in the absence of meaning anymore. We don't have a collective mythology anymore. Yes. So we find it in these sub-tribes. And then in order to make sense of the world, we have to interpret data through the lens of the tribe's central meme, whatever it is. And if it's, I hate Trump, or if it's, I love Trump, then it's just gonna, it's gonna split into different things. Just like ivermectin seems to have been picked up by the right. Why? It makes no sense. Why would a medication be politicized or masking picked up by the left. Like, wh why? Right. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I mean, I, I guess I the sense I have about masking is that because Donald Trump didn't do it, so we're going to do exactly it really hard. Right. Yeah. And I almost imagine a counterfactual world. Imagine if Donald Trump came out with a, you know a, a big mask that has an American flag on one side and mag on the other side, and he said, "I am really firmly committed to masking. We're going to mask everyone. We're going to mask every two year old and above. Gonna we're going to do this. It's going to be huge. It's going to be great. That's how we're going to keep the virus away. We can all go back to work. We're just going to mask, mask through this and get through this." If he pushed masking, I bet. What you would hear is liberals would say, um, you know what? Actually, you know, there are no cluster randomized trials. They'll say what they'll say what I've been saying. There are no cluster randomized trials. Younger, we should probably should study it. There are probably some downstream harms on language acquisition. We don't know for sure. We need to keep it open. You know, it would just flip the whole narrative. And what if he pushed lockdowns very hard? I think you'd see great different um the academy. Authoritarian yeah, accusations. Some, yeah. I think that would be one. And I think the academy, of which I am a part, university professors, strongly opposed Donald Trump. And in the academy, now there's such a strong, overwhelming, I think, at least on social media voice that, you know, we ought to do these restrictions more, sooner, earlier, harder. Mm -hmm. Had Trump come in favor of those restrictions, I think the academy would have split in half and it would have been, you know, half the people pro restrictions, half against. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. It would have been quite interesting. It is interesting. You know, that feeds right into this idea of the chilling effect, right? Where if you're not in, so if you actually disagree with the predominant tribe that you're in, <clears throat> and you say something, you watch on social media how you get beaten down. And it's not just beaten down, it's personally attacked. It's like, a, you're a bad human being, you're dangerous. I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've been called dangerous. I'm like, well, I'm five foot five, I couldn't <laughs> hurt a fly. <laughs> I'll tell you what I find most baffling. Um, one of the accusations that among the personal attacks against me is that like, I don't have a clinical practice, I don't see patients. Like that's just wrong. My, I'm a, I'm a, I'm on service three months a year. <laughs> I'm running clinic every Monday. My fellow even asked me. He was like, you know, for a guy who doesn't see patients, according to Twitter, you sure on service a lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, what is this? And and ironically, some of the people who they themselves are most concerned about misinformation have eagerly and gleefully latched on to this outright lie about somebody who they disagree with on policy issues. It's a delusion like I've never seen. Man, it's quite a it's quite a mob uh, a mob attack I've seen on you. Uh, which I enjoy watching from the sidelines because, <laughs> because the thing is, I know you. Uh -huh. So it's like, I know who you are. I know what you stand for. I know that you can take it because you're not, you know, the kind of person who falls apart in the face of personal attacks. You are quite intellectually and emotionally sound. Yes, you have a temper uh, because I have one too. And sometimes we get angry, but that's okay. That's normal human. But it is kind of... It's interesting because from a sociological standpoint, it's like, wow, the same tribe that we emerge from will turn on you if you at all kind of uh, consistently, and you've done it consistently, you're saying, hey, you're challenging some of our core beliefs that drugs just pretty much work if, if the trials say they do, that you know, medical reversal is not a thing because yeah. you know we're better than that. You know these kind of things. It's so interesting to me because I guess yeah, the attacks are most vociferous from people of whom I'm probably very close to because you know, um, look at the themes of my books. The themes of my books are very critical of the pharmaceutical industry, right. very critical of runaway capitalism, very critical of, of of deregulation in support of really thoughtful regulation. That's the themes of my books, um, and I do identify as a, somebody on the political left. Uh, and yet in this pandemic, I see I do think that many issues that we on the political left should have gotten right, we got wrong. We 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 fucked up schools. I mean, mm -hmm. that is the greatest screw up of the political left I've ever witnessed. The schools issue, I think there's already public opinion polling that's gonna show that Democrats are gonna get hurt by that, uh, by being on the wrong side of the schools issue. Schools, it's it's such a catastrophe. I mean, I think it's, it's hard to overstate how much of a catastrophe the schools decision was. And I do think we got it wrong because we are too focused on that one man and we weren't focused on the kids. And I've said that before, um, that we hated him more than we loved the children. And, <laughs> And, 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 and uh, you know, that irked people, but that was, I think that's, there's some core but truth. But it's there. true. It's yeah. true. And not only is it true, like there's data to 
support. It's true. Uh, Vlad Kogan has a paper in the American Enterprise Institute where he's actually documented week by week sentiment around schools, and he shows the moment this man opened his mouth, this public sentiment flipped on a flipped. dime. Yeah. And also, all of the data suggests that it is true. One, the places that close for the longest are left-leaning. They're places with strong school unions, et cetera. The unions routinely oppose reopening under even, I think, quite generous San circumstances. Francisco, yeah. It's been a fiasco. San Francisco, yeah. Chicago, Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, many cases they had to have like under like brute force applied to them to actually reopen. Um, I think so that was one issue. And then I think also I think we were, were a little bit too ex- – like um, if you want people to do something like distance and mask, you should at least acknowledge that uh, under some circumstances it makes less sense. Mm. Outdoors in the breeze – don't make so much sense. Mm-hmm. Um, after you're double vaccinated and boosted, d- <laughs> don't make much sense. When you're two years old on an airplane screaming, you know, my understanding of being a liberal is to have some compassion. And I see all these videos and they are, some of them are going viral and maybe some are, you know, sort of um, manipulations. But uh, I, do, my, I do think that if there's some screaming toddler that really doesn't want to wear the mask, instead of throwing the family off the airplane, as, I've, mm-hmm. as people have Same. said, Maybe the compassionate thing to do is just be like, let's just take this plane off. This is just, you know, it's one kid not wearing yeah. a mask. And you know what? The WHO, they don't recommend it. And you know what? Also, across Europe right now, there's no masking of kids yeah. in the airplanes. Yeah. And so, you know, have some sense that, you know, this is just like being a doctor 101. Right. It's not public a, health 101. It's public health 101. Like, yeah. I don't know. What do you do when you're patient? Like, you will have some patient that doesn't take every single medicine you've given them on every single minute of the day. Do you disavow them, throw them out, never see them again? No, you meet them where they are. You try to make progress. You throw out some medicines that are kind of, you know, marginal, and you pick the ones that are most important, and you really try to, like, work with them on that. Uh, that's called being a doctor. This idea, uh, uh, the, uh, also on the political left, I've heard people say, if you didn't get vaccinated, you shouldn't get health care. Have you yeah, heard this? I've heard this, yeah. What is or, this? Or you should have to pay for it. I actually tweeted, I retweeted an article that was proposing that, and I said, well, this is interesting. It has a lot of baggage here. What do you guys think? And and uh, I got appropriate responses, which were like, that's insane. Like right. that idea is insane. Um, the whole purpose of the Affordable Care Act was to say, it doesn't matter how you got ill. We will take care of you. We will not discriminate. The whole thing, like the, it's like a core principle of medicine. If somebody cuts themselves committing an armed robbery, do you not stitch them up? Right. If someone has committed a crime, do you not provide medical care? Of course, it doesn't matter what someone did. Right. You're a doctor. You have an oath. The oath transcends all of this. We don't make people pay higher premiums if they eat Twinkies all day and smoke. We, you know, it, it, you, it, <laughs> these are very complex behaviors. Behaviors that are the end product of a system that is unjust in innumerable ways, um, from uh, the, the media information people are given to wealth inequality to like deep seated problems. And you cannot punish individuals for all of these systemic factors. That is what it means to be a liberal. The liberal side has totally forgotten. A that. classic liberal. And, a classic and liberal, again, yeah. I think you said the word compassion. That's really what it is. And there's tons of conservative thought that actually is very. That, that's why I think so many conservatives are deeply offended by the response to the pandemic because it is unfair. It, it penalizes poor people, people who are actually vulnerable, which you would go, oh, well, that's like, isn't that liberal thought? No, it's just like compassion. It's compassion. That's just compassion. And uh, so this idea that we've been uncompassionate. So what happens now is we have this pandemic of mental yeah. illness and kids that's getting worse that was already accentuated by social media and screens. So what did we do? We took them out of school and put them in front of social media and screens for a year and made the adults around them go crazy and be at home. And now you're stuck together with like parents that you don't, you're don't you not used to being with all day or some extended family and it's crazy shit. And and you don't even have good Wi-Fi because you're in a low socioeconomic status. And so you're actually even more, it's just basically schools becoming this very dysfunctional vacation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, somebody told me that like, one of the things you're pointing to is that some people, they themselves may be quite unhappy uh, in the moment. And somebody's pointing out to me, they're saying like somebody who like uh, was very critical of me or like went after me really hard. They're like, did you see this person's other tweets? And I was like, no, of course not. I'm like, what, what do I have time to follow people who like dislike me? No, I don't have time for that. Um, uh, and then they're like, well, these other tweets reveal that they're like going through some hardships and stuff like that. And so I think, you know, mm. I also like try to, as much as I can, be a bigger person to like let some of this go because I think other people 
are suffering in different ways. And one of the ways in which in the modern world, if you're suffering, is you want to go online and you want to beat up on whomever, whoever it was who tweeted the thing of the day that you didn't like or whatever. Okay, this is like, I'm going to triple down on this point. So I, I, you know, I get the death threats. So one time I got a death threat and I was like, you know, you gonna, do? Yeah, yeah, me. Yeah, all the time. For what? Um, For being pro vaccination? Whether it's vaccination, whether it's saying something that's politically offensive to another side, by, by being in this kind of, radical- well, You're alt middle. Exactly, but alt middle means you see everything is true, but partial. Okay. So you may find something true on a side that the other side is just, no, that's never gonna be true, I right? See. Absolutist thinking. So it triggers people to send me these kind of kooky, kind of sometimes thinly veiled death threats, sometimes just overtly, I'm gonna find you and murder you oh and for what you've said about this. So I actually responded to one of them and I'm like, yeah, I'm just curious, first of all, if this email is real. And second of all, you know, why so mad? <laughs> and uh, and just kind of made it clear that I was gonna listen to them, right? Oh my gosh, they write back this whole thing. Yeah, I, I you know, I'm really, I don't know. I look back at the email I sent you and it, I, it's clearly crazy. I'm sorry. This is what I was feeling. This is why I was feeling it. This is what I'm going through. And it's a whole life story. And I was like, oh shit, I actually feel this outpouring of love for this person. Like this is like, yes, dysfunctional it's, to some degree inexcusable, but at the same time you go, oh, now, if we actually just assumed everybody was having the worst day of their life when they send a crazy, or they're just, there's something going on in their life, we'd be a lot better off, but we don't do it. If we yeah. taught our kids that, yeah. then all the social media bullying, Instagram FOMO bullshit, it's like, dude, think about that. Next time you see a chick on Instagram, little daughter of mine, who, who by the way, they don't have Instagram, they don't have any social media, I don't let them have it until they're 18. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, no way. I actually had never been on Instagram. I don't even know what it looks it's like. It's garbage. Okay. I'm on it, but I use it purely for, I, I uh, just yeah. do I'll, my educational yeah, yeah, pieces sure. and I run. But like beautiful Instagram model, having the best day of her life, takes a picture and you're like, man, that's the life. And then you find out six months later, she's died by suicide. Oh, dear. You know, it, it, it's a pattern. Like we, we, we rely on these superficial signs of what we think are success, whereas inside the turmoil and all that, that we're repressing and denying and projecting and doing all this. I think until we actually are able to introspect and turn the lens on ourselves, we're never gonna fix these systemic issues that we, because they're, they're epiphenomenon of us. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a whole nother conversation. No, I mean, it's a very interesting thing. I mean, the one thing you say that makes me think about is like, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm disturbed to hear that anyone would wish you like personal harm. And I guess, I guess the reason I'm really disturbed about it is because I just, you know, I mean, I can't imagine you even getting into a territory where people are so, you know, where passions are so high. But the other thing I think is like, it's a strange thing to wish away people you disagree with, to wish they didn't exist or to wish they died or to wish like that they are, I don't know, not allowed to speak. I mean, mm. if you have ideas you're really passionate about, and I have ideas I'm really passionate about, like my reversal work and my, my cancer drug policy stuff, those last four chapters of that book, like, like, I would, like I would do anything if like we could implement that stuff. And around COVID, some of these things, I'm passionate about these ideas. Like, I don't want people who disagree with me to like, um, uh, like not exist, right? that's not fun. And like, it's not fun, it's not like fair, it's not just. I like want to persuade some of them and then I want to, have the other ones know that their ideas are losing. <laughs> I want them to like live and watch their idea be destroyed by my better formulation and more articulate version. Yeah, I want to watch them watch the die. No, not, 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 but just like to end that idea, like, you know, to show why that idea is wrong and, right. and maybe that they will eventually acknowledge it. And I will say that there are a few moments in like, I don't know, uh, you know, many years ago I had this thing where I was like one of the first people very critical of like the genome directed cancer therapy. And I wasn't critical in the sense like, of course I prescribe all these drugs. I think they're very useful. Um, but I was critical of like the, the the media landscape that made it feel like every cancer patient will get a genome drug, which is just right. simply, strictly not true. And I would say that like, you know, you guys are exaggerating this, you're embellishing it. And then finally, to kind of prove my point, we did a paper where we like estimated what percent benefit from these drugs. And the answer was like, I think at the time, like 9% or something or 8% or sorry, were even eligible for, like could even take the drug it was like 8% and 4% had tumor shrinkage, et cetera. So some like, it was less than 10% or something like that, or 10%. And it wasn't 50%, it wasn't 70%, right? And so we published that estimate and that estimate, like people don't, in, like now they won't see it as provocative because you ask them and they're like, they feel like it was always true. But at the time it was quite provocative because people's intuition was like 50%. And we published 10% and we just took all the air out of the balloon and the people who vociferously and passionately disagreed with me now they well, like first they like laughed at it they were angry with it and then finally they acted like they believed that all along <laughs> and that's and that's one of the that's, ways yeah. in which ideas like when you that's when a, when your ideas triumph over other ideas like the school closure thing we were both on that early there's a docu there's a paper trail like how early we were on how important it was to reopen schools eventually when the majority of people 
and it'll be the vast majority. I've been saying it's going to be like 99% of people will see that as a huge screw up. They will act like they were always for school reopenings. Yeah. 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 They won't see that they were ever against it. Yeah, it's true. This this is the evolution of ideas. And th- that's why you need the discourse and you need the person. Now, what's interesting is like, I think a lot of people in the professional misinformation business uh, really <laughs> like to argue that same thing, the Semmelweis argument that like, no, we're just ahead of the curve here. The mainstream is completely wrong. We're sounding the alarm that these vaccines are gonna cause cancer and long-term risks and this and that and the other thing. But the, but the I think the problem there is, again, you can argue those things. So let them speak. Let you know the Vonden Bushes and these, uh, Robert Malone and these guys, let them talk. I think what, what we have though is an information ecology that's so fractured around tribalism that the average Joe can't distinguish a fringe view yeah. said by someone with decent credentials yeah. from a, a more, it's not even a, accepted, it's just a more <laughs> consistent with the data view. Yes, yes. But I, I, it's such a good point. I mean, I- So I, how do you, how do you, yeah, how yeah, do you- no, yeah. I, don't, I recently saw somebody say that like, um, People like John Mandrola, cardiologist, yeah. you know, Kentucky, published an estimate of myocarditis, one in 6,800, roughly in the middle of other estimates, and now, like, pretty close to probably what the true estimate is. They were like, you know, he fuels the people on that fringe anti-vax side by giving them ammunition, and he, like, encourages them and entrenches them, makes them stronger. And, and then they said something like, you know, when you're being retweeted by, I don't know, some of the names you said, when you're being retweeted by those people, you have to ask yourself what kind of person you yeah, are, right? That's right. Okay. I get that too. Yeah. Okay. So then what – but then um, the counter argument I think is that if you pursue truth, you cannot judge truth based on who retweets it, who likes it. If you say the sky is blue and Donald Trump likes your tweet – does the sky is the sky not blue? Mm. You know, you have to pursue truth. That's one. Two, is it Don? Is, and actually, an empirical question: Is it the case that people who truthfully pursue safety signals are the ones emboldening people critical of products, or is it the people who want to not talk about it, want to downplay it, want to use false denominators, want to mislead on myocarditis, want to ignore myocarditis? There's somebody who was arguing with me, and then um, uh, about this myocarditis, they deleted all their tweets where they said like it's not real early oh, on. You know, yeah. and and so like I would say. My opinion was is that you being so dogged and unwilling to be honest about myocarditis actually emboldens them more right. because they're actually saying like, look, the mainstream establishment doesn't want you to know about this. John Mandrola is honestly pursuing something that he thinks matters. Um, and I think it's a mistake to, uh, I guess it's a mistake always to choose your views based on what people you dislike may think. You believe what you believe and it's up to other people to react to it. Um, but it's really, I think, dangerous to suppress safety signals um, because you worry how to be misused because I think you'll actually lose a lot of trust. That, that's the thing. It's about really honest transparency. Um, you know, one of the things that I did early on that I think I was incorrect, which we'll talk about, we can talk about it now, <coughs> was this idea of gain of function research and uh, could this be a lab leak thing? And early on, I kind of, really felt into the mainstream narrative on this and was like, you know, they've probably looked at these sequences. It doesn't seem reasonable. We know that other SARS-CoV-2, or SARS-CoV-1, MERS, they came from legitimate animal hosts. That's where this usually comes from. Um, and I, I would publicly say, I, I, that's nonsense. It's misinformation. It's ideologically based. And there's a little tinge of racism here, you know? Yeah. That's, that's how I felt at the time. And then became convinced more and more that no, no, it's it's an equally likely <laughs> possibility that this thing was, you know, or we ought to be looking at it very, very carefully instead of just taking this narrative. And so I had to alter my my viewpoint. So how do I judge my old self? Yeah. I have to judge my old self based on did I try to do the best I yeah, could at the yeah. time? And so what was my thinking like? Was it biased? Can I see it in retrospect? Did I see it at the time? That's kind of how I think. it. So for me, I'm always looking for truth, but I'm also looking for how I'm looking for truth as a kind of meta phenomenon. Like, am I doing that correctly or am I ideologically biased or what's going on? Well, that's such an interesting thing. I mean, to some degree, I think all of us, um, we all guard and have guardrails on our thinking that conform with what expectations are in our communities. Like, there are places you, you cannot let your mind go, or at least you can't say you let your mind go there. Right, right. Um, and I think that was one they were strong guardrails on. I mean, I mean, every every bit of establishment made it seem like that we knew. And I guess, I mean, to some degree, to be fair to you, I mean, you're not a sequencing expert. I mean, I'm not a sequencing expert right. either. And every sequencing expert had written that very strong condemnation in the Lancet where they came down very forcefully. Now that, that letter's not yeah. looking so good. Yeah. But they did come down and they're like, stop talking about this. You know, that's right. what they said. And, and then Facebook banned it and they're like, 
like, okay, I don't know. I mean, I think I mostly stayed out of it because I have no clue. About yeah, where you, I'm just not, I'm not smart enough I in that field. Yeah, I don't know about like, I still don't know, but I do think the new, the new email or the new uh, NIH letter by, uh, by Lawrence uh, Tabarak is out and uh, basically saying that this eco, whatever, eco lab or eco, yeah, eco health or eco health or whatever called. that, 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 that they were doing research that, you know, there's a big dis- debate on what gain of function means, yeah. but to me, it's like, were you juicing that virus yeah. or not? Were yeah. you juicing it up to like infect? And I don't know, it looking like maybe like they were they NIH funded juicing that up. Um, it, it, you know, it comes to. It really, talking about compassion, I have more compassion for people who are very skeptical of authority after that event, because it's exactly yeah. that. I listen to these genome sequencing experts. By the way, like I have a, I did a master's thesis at Berkeley in oh, genetics so you know on something. Drosophila. You know so when I see these experts, some of whom I know who they are, saying no, I'm like, okay, I, I buy that. I, you know a lot more about this than I do. So I can then publicly say, I don't think this is gain, you know, this is natural mm. uh, zoological transmission, zoonotic transmission. And now I'm like, wait. So every single expert has their own bias. Yeah. And in fact, sometimes we're so in our own crap that that we, you know, uh, we, we can't even see the bias. We're the easiest people to self-deceive because much of our identity is tied into this particular belief. So that's something that we have to we have to recognize. Now it doesn't mean that like all the crazy misinformation people are correct. It just means, hey, you shouldn't be penalized for asking questions about stuff that's with good intent and with discourse. Did you have a lot of fly paper in your lab to catch the stray Drosophila? So it's a funny story. I used to teach MCAT down the road. And so I would go there with like files of this, these fucking fruit flies because I had to, I had to screen them for wing mutations. Uh-huh. And one time one of them like broke open in my backpack. And to this day, <laughs> the room in that facility, fly. there's fruit flies in the facility. <laughs> like to this day. And the reason I know oh this is God. the guy I used to teach with, the guy who hired me, this guy, Dale Schmidt, lovely human being, he passed away recently of a brain tumor. So I went to his memorial in Berkeley. And this was just as things were starting to open after vaccines were happening. And even in Berkeley, people weren't wearing masks and they were hugging and it was beautiful, right? Yeah. It was a spring of hope. And uh, <laughs> his, um, his son told me, yeah, Dale used to complain nonstop that you know, Zubin back in 1994 brought fruit flies and they've never left. <laughs> and I'm like, legacy, legacy. That you can all tell them because of their mutated wing. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. They were me. They were. I was like the X Men of uh, of Drosophila. I had a friend who worked at Drosophila lab, and I'd like. He was like, "Oh, meet me in lab after work. We'll go get a drink or something." I'd go to that lab, and they'd be like, "Always stray fruit flies in all the air. over, all over." I'm like, "What is this thing?" You're and then I forget. How did you anesthetize them or something? The like, CO two gas. That's right. CO two. You snuck yeah. them out with CO two. Yeah. And then can you ref- you refrigerate them too or something? Yes. So when you put them in the fridge, it slows it's, their development. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So, so well, he's like pulling all these fruit flies out of the refrigerator. I was like, what is dude, this? <laughs> dude, it, that scene, I'll tell you, that's when I knew research was not for me. Like, you know, you find you, is this my authentic me? No, I used to have to make the fruit fly uh, food, the auger medium that, that you put on the dish that they, they eat. And what are they like? They like vinegar. It's well, what they what they like is fermented. So fermented sugar. You take mm-hmm. agar, sugar, yeast, and you make it into this big <laughs> vat, and you're stirring it. And I was like a line cook, right? Just making this fruit fly medium. And I swear to God, I was so hungry at times, I would reach into no. this vat. Yeah, it was awful. And I'd just be like, oh, oh, molasses was one of the components. And I'd just be like. You drinking raw molasses? No, I was desperate. I was in college. I had no food. <laughs> But so yeah, you, now you're I'm eating the same damaged. thing as the experimental subjects. Basically, I became, I started to look like a fruit fly. I had variegated eyes. I, you know. I think it's a Kafka novel in here. I think like, it, yeah, I believe you're correct. Yeah, something, yeah. Something yeah, like yeah. The, I mean, there you go. I like Jeff, Jeff, uh, what, who, what's his name? The guy who played Gold, the fly? Goldblum. Goldblum, Goldblum with, the, yeah. with the back hair. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. Well, anyway, so back to what we were <laughs> talking about. Back to what we were um, talking about, right. Fascinating walk down memory lane. Um <laughs> What were we saying? COVID yeah. broke our brains. COVID broke our brains. What's that about? Or should we talk about the Fauci gain of function? Well, for COVID broke our brains. I think COVID broke our brains because I think that's that's the theme of what we're talking about is that, you know, it was difficult for people to be impartial on uh, school reopenings. I think even to this day, um, <laughs> you know, one of the things that I uh, – it's strange. I don't get a lot of hate email, you know, but uh, I guess it, it finds other ways to reach me. But, Twitter. Uh, yeah. Twitter, yeah, tw- yeah. Probably Twitter. Um, but somebody, you know, people were critical of my Atlantic article and I had a med page article about that on like the evidence for masking kids. And I think, you know, I guess um, 
I would just wish someday somebody will like if the academic profession will want to actually be honest about like how we didn't have really good evidence for doing that. We didn't have any cluster randomized trials and that they were like huge differences across Western Europe and, and this country. But I think many people just cannot acknowledge that they view it as like um, and they view it as a dangerous idea to even talk about that. And that to me is like uh, one of the ways in which our brains are broken a little bit. Like yeah. we're so wounded that we can't even. Yeah. Let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. So let's say they ultimately do these trials. Yes. They're not and going to. But go they're on. not going to. They're not but going to. Let's say they do, and they find that. Okay. Not only are even the crappy cloth mask, any kind of face covering, <clears throat> is super effective at dropping the R naught of this virus, and would have saved hundreds of millions of lives or whatever it is. Right. How would you respond as? the stances that you've taken, how would question. that, how would you interpret that? How would you stand up and talk publicly about that? How would you feel internally about that? I guess I would say, I would say that um, that information would be so powerful, it would extinguish a lot of the ongoing debates. And had they done that study early in the pandemic, you would have saved those lives right. because all these governors would have fallen like dominoes and they would have had to do it when you have that, that kind of clear, convincing evidence. They may have put up some resistance, but you know, um, even the governors who are unwilling to go on the mask mandate, I've not heard a single one of them say vaccines don't work. Right. You know, They have to, some degree, when you show them ironclad data, right. they do swallow it. And right. if you really show that, but I will tell you, it won't show that. And I think here's why it won't show that. Because even in Bangladesh, when the population had no pre-existing immunity and no vaccination, the cloth mask failed. Absolutely yeah, yeah. failed. Surgical was better. Yeah. And surgical worked. Surgical yeah. worked. That data point, if we knew that in March of 2020, that would have saved many, many more lives. And even to this day, the CDC mm. should delete every cloth... Around, I just went to get coffee, you know, before I came to meet Everyone's you. wearing cloth masks. Cloth, why are we doing this? Right. If, like, if you're going to wear the mask, wear the mask that worked. Right. Why are you wearing the inferior mask? There's right. no shortage of surgical masks now. Right. In fact, you want some, just go to the ocean and scoop up a handful. <laughs> they <laughs> they're, fill, they're they're around the ocean. A, they're around a turtle's neck. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. No, but, it's, 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 it's absolutely true. And yeah. I always wore surgical masks um, early in the pandemic before vaccine. After vaccine, I stopped wearing masks. And then I started wearing cloth when they made it mandated because I'm like, this is a placebo. But I could be pretty proven wrong on that by data, but they're not going to do So the that's trial. the other thing. Um, after vaccination, there are, no relevant re there are no relevant data at all. So that needs its own study. Right. Um, I also had a, I think I had a box that was really old of surgical masks. And I wore that early in the pandemic and uh, it's just a better mask. It's a better I mean, mask. It's, a better it's ma more comfortable it's too. More, actually, it's I more, actually like it. It's more comfortable. Yeah. It's easier on the ears. It's yeah. not a garbage piece of cloth. Yeah. And, I diaper what, yeah yeah no no it's no, no, not no, some no, stupid cloth mask it's, of course. we're gonna hopefully we'll learn something out of this but i actually do think i think as we wake up a little bit to how much suffering and how little compassion there's been I, maybe we'll have a collective awakening but um i'm an optimist actually about that i think i think it's necessary actually but um but we'll see What's again it? but you can't silence people you can't i think it's a mistake i think it's really it's really i don't know we You're, do we do have to be careful you and i both though that uh, not to interpret legitimate discourse that disagrees with us as an attack on us personally, right? That's true. So sometimes I, I, my instinct is to interpret it that way and I have to stop myself and go, no, this is actually a really, <laughs> this is a val is a person putting out a valid concern and I'll often respond to those and say, okay. yeah, you know. That's good. Not on I Twitter because I don't I guess engage on I, Twitter. I would say that the classes of personal attacks are, um, it's not just true for you and I, it's true for anybody who's been personally attacked this last year is like speculating about motives. Right. What is Jay Bhattacharya, what is Jay Bhattacharya really oh, after? What's he really, what's Z Dog really after? He's after this. So I'm like, what kind of worldview you have where you and all your friends are honestly pursuing the truth. But anyone who has sees it any way different, they're out for some secondary gain. That's, always, That's a perverted view. Okay, two, yeah. speculating about who you are, what you do, where you live, what you eat, what you do, all this personal stuff. Right. Three, um, you know, just the dismissive, like, oh, everything that person says is wrong. Right. Really? I was like, right. you know what? That's uh, even somebody who many people dislike, Donald Trump. He said we should re reopen schools. You know what? He was yeah, right. He was about right. It, right. So everybody is not. No one is wrong about every single thing. Right. 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 And you know, uh, there, there, there is this. Uh, there is this kind of um, stereotyping that happens too. Like I know, like if I get attacked on Twitter, there is a ninety percent pretest probability that the person who attacks me is self-describing with thirteen pronouns, a rainbow flag, and some other things, and they're not gay not a minority and not a woman. Uh, and so it is this interesting kind of, we, we, we were talking about virtue signaling in previous, like this idea that to your tribe, you signal that I am part of the tribe by saying, this is what I feel like I should say. 
but there's a thing, even vulnerability sig- signaling, uh, that's right? That's what I was yeah. talking about, yeah. Yeah. Performative vulnerability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something new I've been seeing a lot on social media. Tell me about this. I guess, um, I don't know. I mean, it's important to acknowledge that, you know, all of us have good days and bad days. I'm sure that's true even for a bubbly person like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> you probably have some bad days. I uh, have many, many. Although I've been getting better as I get older. I'm more, in, my emotions are more experienced as energy than they are as something with cognitive attachment. Interesting. So in fact, and this is a quick aside, quick aside. Uh, The other day, somebody, um, that's what it was. I was doing a live show and somebody left a comment during the live show that I read and I was like, man, that really triggered me. Like that really made me mad. I was like, and uh, so I was sitting watching TV with the kids and I started feeling this like, anxiety, you know, like you get when you're kind of personally attacked. And then I was like, what is this? Oh, it's that comment that was made. And oh. look, ooh, look how it's manifested. Why is, what's the cognitive belief I have? <clears throat> oh, that I'm, that I, that she's right. And that I actually am a bad person I see. because I said this thing. Oh, wait, no, let me feel into that. And then you just feel it as this vibrating energy. And I'm, well, I'm just gonna allow this to exist here. And it just passes through you as energy. And instead of wrapping you into a cognitive neurotic loop of thought. Interesting. Uh, and so that's something that only in my, through introspection have I been able to do. But earlier I would have gotten in a pattern of just, okay, I'm gonna stop the movie now. I'm gonna go upstairs and write some angry emails or <laughs> do some tweets or try to you know, project my way out of this. I mean, I feel similar to you in the sense that as you get older, I think my emotions have come like a lot. Like I used to feel, I don't know, a lot more emotions when I was in my 20s, you know, right, in my for 30s. Sure. And now it's like, uh, you know, and like, I don't know, when I wake up most days, uh, most days I'm, I, I tend to be a chipper person, you yeah. know, for better or worse. And it got a lot, and I, I didn't tell people this. I think about moving from Portland to San Francisco, Oh yeah. I, like, you know, people are like, oh, Portland's so gray, it's so cloudy. I was like, Portland has two seasons. We have the summer, which is like three months of San Francisco, or three months of like Bay Area weather. And then we have the winter of nine months where I like describe it as like, it's like sleeping under the mister in the produce section, <laughs> but the mister is like always going for <laughs> nine straight months. And it's not a rain, it's just a mist. It's a mist, yeah. And it's like dark and, you know, but I would ride my bike to work every day and I'd like get a, you know, heartbeat up and stuff. And so I was always pretty happy. Um, but then I moved here and like one, I was like, oh my God, it's like a fog was lifted off me. I was like, wow. I was really having some seasonal affective disorder. I didn't even know it. Um, uh, we are so deeply connected to our environment and when we're not sensitive to it, yeah. it just rules us. So when I lived in San Francisco in the inner sunset for UCSF oh, for four years, year. fog four all year. the time, miserable, depressed, suicidally depressed third year of medical school. When I moved to Stanford down the peninsula to do my residency, yeah. it was like a cloud had lifted. And then eight years later, or however, 10 years later, Vegas. when I moved to Vegas, I was just like, it was 320 days of sun. Yeah. And not just sun, but bright, yes, yes, high yes, UV content. Yes, yes, like yes. I was overjoyed most yes. days. Yeah, it's crazy. We're really deeply tied to our environment. I think it's true. And yeah. so um, so now I think like like my bad days, I wake up and my enthusiasm to work is low. Yeah. But I still probably do a lot of work on those days. <laughs> <laughs> but then the days I wake up when my enthusiasm is good, Oh, don't, crushing don't, it, crushing yeah, crush it. You're one of the most productive people I know. So so you were saying the vulnerability. Oh, the vulnerability. Okay, yeah. right. So I guess what I wanted to say about that was, um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I do think um, there is a danger if you process all your emotions through social media. Mm. And I see increasingly there's a new type of, you know, there used to be conspicuous consumption. Then there was like conspicuous production. So like conspicuous consumption, like in the eighties, like I bought a sports car, conspicuous production, like, oh, in like the last decade was like, oh, look at my um, dinner I cooked for my family. And it's like, so wonderful dinner. Um, Now the new thing is like conspicuous vulnerability. And it's like, um, you know, my cousin's dog died and, uh, or my cousin's friend's person, you know, that died and this person meant a lot to me. And um, I'm going to take the day to reflect or, you know, or or I didn't get my grant funded, or I didn't do this, and I'm just tweeting this, I'm just saying this, I'm just posting this to show you all that, you know, even successful people have off days, that we all, you know, struggle, we all do this. And I'm like, I'm like, of course, you know, yes, it's a nice message to send, but come on, it's so performative. I was like, come on, <laughs> hey, everyone, like you're all doing it now, what happened? Five years ago, no one did this. Now everyone, I didn't get this grant, I didn't get this. And I was like, look, I publish, I'm published like 40, academic papers a year. If I published every rejection I got on Twitter, I put like two out a day. <laughs> I've like, got another paper. Got another. You can't even, I don't even think about it for one second. Got to move forward. I got to get these, get these papers out the door. Come on. Man, it, it's, it's a circus performance 
and again, it's a tribal thing. Like it's you know, it's what Brene Bar Brene Brown calls bar, vul- vulnerability Barbie, right? Oh, like um. she got typecast by doing this TED talk about vulnerability and shame, which was oh, really good oh, talk, oh, one oh, of the famous oh. talks. But she, but then she was like, "Oh, you're vulnerability Barbie, right? You're like you made it cool to be vulnerable." And this it's is like, like it, vulnerability porn. It's like and then yeah, people get yeah. and then people like add to it and they have like the, I don't know what to think. And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, part There's of me, an inauthenticity about. I it. think it's That's inauthentic. Thing, yeah. And like I don't know if you really are grieving. Yeah. You don't got you don't time go to t- write your 25 you tweet. Po- you don't go on it. No. You're in your bed under the yeah, covers yeah. crying. Yeah. You're you're de- you're, feeling you're, it. you're devastated. And you know what? And if like somebody told me this young person younger than me, uh, he, he told me that like he thinks that the younger generation they only know how to process their grief through, through this. Yeah. And I was like, "Oh, man, that's, God, bad. that's bad." But because the thing is, they, you know, Emotion, uh, my friend Angelo calls it energy in motion. It's really a, an energetic thing that you feel in the present moment. Mm-hmm. If you try to escape from that feeling by projecting onto social media or creating a persona or adding cognitive layers of thought to it, the emotion doesn't go anywhere. It just festers. Yeah. You know, it's there. That energy has nowhere to go, and you you carry it around. So. What I've learned is now, you know, like sometimes I'll just be driving and something will trigger an emotion and I'll just like start crying in the car, which is weird because then you look at like people left and right and they're looking at what the fuck is this guy doing crying? And, 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 and the radio's playing, don't stop believing. <laughs> Exactly. It's like, when the lights go, I'm like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. But the, what's, what's interesting is the emotion is so pure that I can't even add a cognitive explanation. I don't know what triggered it really, but you just let it go through. And then 30 seconds later, it's like, it's like you're, you've been through a rainstorm and it's passed and there's sunlight. It's crazy. Mm. So this is only in my elder years that this has started happening. It used to be, you would just feel like, you'd feel something, you'd be like. <laughs> and stifle it and not deal with stifle it. Stifle it or and, come and, up with a cognitive explanation. Yeah, and like, I don't know, when you, you sometimes you have to work through grief. It takes years. And sometimes oh, yeah. you have to think about it and try to get to the root of what it is you you know, would have done differently what you miss, what you really are, what really pains you and put your finger on what pains you. Sometimes it's not so easy. And it's not processed through this fake world of people who mostly don't really know you and don't really care about you. And it's, I find it, I find it quite sad. Actually, It is very depressing. And actually one thing you said about putting your finger on the emotion, yeah. which by the way, none of this is what we were intending no. to talk about. It's perfect. We misinterpret that energetic pattern often. So what what you said about like, oh, you know, I have this thing and I need to f- get to the root of it. Often when you get to the root emotion, it's something like fear of abandonment or fear of helplessness or fear of uh, intimacy. It's something like very core fear-based that you've called anger <laughs> or, you know, irritation or frustration. Or that you've made about someone else when it's about you. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. It's right. always uh, ultimately about us because other people don't control us. You know, we, we, we're in full control when we actually really, actually nobody's in control. Things are just happening. And when you let that go, then then you really have control. You're like, ah, oh, yeah. of course, it's called equanimity. You're just like, oh, this is just yeah. how it is. Yeah. I, think, I think that's one of the things is that, um, if you think you'll be happy when something happens, you're never going to be happy because there's always going to be that thing on the horizon. You got to be happy in the moment. That's the root tr- teaching of all spiritual traditions too. A desire and aversion are the core of suffering. It's like always grasping for the next thing. Always, will, did it make you happy? Maybe for 30 seconds I had dopamine. And then then I'm like, what's the next thing I'm going to do? You know, you know why I like coming over here? Mm. Because I like talking to you. Just the color, because I like talking to you. <laughs> I like because, you too. No, because it's like, I don't know, it's rare that you talk to somebody who I feel like, I feel like we always have a good conversation. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. Uh, somebody was asking me like, you know, like what's your like, I don't know, what's your like perfect day? I was like, for me, my perfect, like my perfect thing, dinner party, six people. Oh. That's like, and six good people. Good people. Good people. I, you know who you are. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know who you are in my life. You know, six good people who know how to not take themselves too seriously, yeah. have a laugh, a yeah. deep laugh, yeah. not get hung up on everything, yeah. not, I don't know, I don't want to hear any complaints, I, and I don't want any record of what was, I don't want any pictures of the dinner. If you take out your fucking phone, no, <laughs> so you take out your fucking phone to take a picture of the dinner, you're not coming to my dinner party, okay? I want a dinner party so popping that you won't even think, like, for you to think to take your phone, take a picture of whatever you're getting, that's a, a, a shitty dinner party. Yeah. A good dinner party, the conversation is so brisk, you wouldn't want to take and a picture. And so present in such a flow yes. state, and yep, 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 yep. And there's authentic yeah. vulnerability. So, but this is what I mean by that. You're you yeah, yeah. without fear. Yes, You're like, oh yes. man, I don't want Vinay to see this side of me because he'll think I'm 
X, Y, or Z. I don't want anyone to screenshot that. You know, you're not worried about screenshotting. It's like, no, I'm not even thinking about social media. So, so ne- <laughs> next week, this. next week, I'm going on um, a six day meditation retreat. I've never done one uh, with with that guy Angela I was telling about. I did shows with, and uh, it's in Monterey, and we're not supposed to speak. I've heard uh, about this. Yeah, and it's going to be really interesting because you're left with yourself in. Silence, and the hardest person to be with can be yourself. Oh, yes. So this will be really interesting. I'm gonna come back either destabilized or awake. I once had uh, somebody close to me. She did this for like 14 days, mm-hmm. and then uh, and she told me that it was like incredibly transformative. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the people who've done it they say that, and and you can you know you can get you can hack that with certain psychedelics, but I don't think it's the same. I think there is the the process of being there with a good teacher and a group of people. Mm-hmm. So there's an energy that happens with a group of people that are all there for the same reason. So it'll be interesting. And some of them are supporters of the show, so because we kind of set it up as like this oh, supporter cool. retreat, so it'll be fun. Um, hopefully, I don't get stabbed. <laughs> no death threats on kind of emails yeah. that I, oh by the way the, the email thing one other thing on that I, I, I wanted to ask you well, go on oh yeah, no, yeah. Just, I, I point out these like negative emails because I think they make good stories but the emails that I typically get are so inspiring like you just go <gasps> you can't even believe it right wow. I know you get these too where you're just like oh my gosh like I feel so inspired to continue trying to do what I'm doing because this person sees me for who I am and they'll say it in an email. They'll take time out of their day to say, I really appreciate what you do with X, Y, and Z. I just want to let you know. And you're like, what the fuck? Oh, you nice. can't even believe it. I yeah. guess I would say a couple things. One, I guess, to be perfectly honest with you, I probably only read like 10% of the stuff that people send me because- it's Too much. I, and I got like too many things to do. And, I, and then I, 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 I got to focus on what I want to do because right. otherwise I would take away from my, my goals. Um, but the next thing I would say is like the thing, um, like the thing that I feel always good about is- um, uh, I have this person from Switzerland, Geneva, Switzerland, Timothy Oliver, Olivier. He is coming to work with me for a year. Wow. And he came because like, I think he like read my book on cancer drug policy. He's an oncologist and like, and like that to me totally makes my day. Cause he like, he, he's read my writing. So he knows how I think. Yeah. And he's sm- smarter than me in lots of different dimensions. So he's pushed my thinking in a lot of things. And he like messaged me. We worked on a bunch of papers. I was like talking to him. Cause like we have our starting off point is like already here. Yeah. So we can talk about like this other stuff. And, uh, I'm so delighted that he's going to be coming here and spending a year as a study abroad scholar. Um, that totally makes my day. It makes my, it makes my year. It makes my year. My God, that's amazing. Yes. And, and like, it gives you the sense that like, okay, this is authentically who I am. They see who I am. Yes. They're who they are. Yes. I appreciate that. We're going to work together. And we found each other in this universe yeah, of people yeah, where yeah. we're the only two weirdos who are interested in this like exactly niche, very niche this. topic. Yeah. I've had similar things happen yeah. and you're just like, holy crap. It really, it's, it's, it's remarkable that that that's a beauty of the social media and internet that's where you're yes. like okay yeah that would never have happened it's like where uh every every 10 people with any uh niche interest can get together including all the crazy ones <laughs> 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 it's true and then you get a real micro tribe going yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. but but it, but that we need that we need some yeah. degree of that because it's never happened in human history where it's been that easy to do let's talk about two more things we gotta talk yeah. about joe rogan yeah, oh yeah, Rogan, CNN. yeah. So the Rogan episode with Gupta, we both did shows on this. So my take was, I was actually surprised it was more of a dialogue than, because I read like Gupta's pieces, like I thought Rogan was gonna come and punch me. And the, and it was all like garbage CNN, like trying to um, make a thing out of Fuel this. their base. Fuel their, their own left-leaning base. left-leaning base. Exactly, yeah. they're ideologically captured by their own audience and yeah. so on. And, and then Rogan's side was just like, you know, all the all the guys that support Rogan were like, oh man, Rogan crushed Gupta and sh- told, showed him what was up. Up and you see, and they would cut out like pieces where Gupta was like, bah, 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 bah. so what, 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 what's your take on all that? I guess, yeah, I, I mean, one, I think it was good discussion, it's always good, and that, and like, I don't know, that's why people like Rogan's show. Everyone's yeah. always wondering, like, what's the secret to Rogan's show? I was like, here's the secret to show he actually talks to someone for three hours. Yeah. You never hear Elon Musk for three hours, you never hear Jack Dorsey for three hours, you never hear Sanjay Gupta for three hours. I've never heard these people talk for three hours, and everyone who's on media. I would imagine. I mean, I don't go on TV or anything, but like they're good at talking for 10 minutes, five minutes. They and say then they're, they're done. Yeah, yeah. But when you talk for three hours, you force them to be who they really are. Oh. You know, they have to get, they can't, all the, all the catchphrases have to go away at some point. So that's why I think he's good at. And on certain topics, I think he is good at eliciting the person to talk about themselves, uh, Joe Rogan. Right. And um, I think in my mind, the, the most interesting part was, of course, this discussion of like, did he take horse dewormer? Right. And I think he's, he is onto something, which is that, 
Joe Rogan, of course, comedian, podcaster, CNN, major reputable news network. Okay, the standards have to be very different uh, between, you know, you and I talking and like if we were actually, if we were a CNN. Right, right. And I think that uh, my view of ivermectin was, you know, we did a video on it and uh, I've done other videos and then like, it's basically like, I'm skeptical of all medical products until they have really good randomized control trials. They are ongoing with ivermectin. Right. And so I'm really careful to say, like, I wouldn't prescribe it, of course. I never like to prescribe things while they're, on, on, you know, not having definitive robust studies. And that's also why I'm also critical of like the masking two-year-olds for right, exactly, 18 months, right? right? Same yeah. principle. Right. Um, but I also, I am very scared to say, you know, you shouldn't say ivermectin is deadly or horse deworm or animal pay or whatever these kinds of pejorative things. Because if you're running the trial, who will want to enroll who if you keep, enroll? Who will enroll? You call it all these nasty terms. So anyway, so I think he did not, in fact, take a veterinary product. He took a human product. Yeah. And they call, they kept calling it and many – and the Washington Post has an op-ed where many, many quotes that they said where they kept portraying it as a veterinary product. Yeah. Um, CNN is, is in fault. Yeah. They, and I don't know why they're doing it. They're doing it because they're leaning into the culture war. Yeah. They're leaning into the culture war to portray him and his supporters as right wing, crazy, which I don't think he even is. I think he's probably no, left of center. He self identifies as kind of progressive left. That's like a thought. Bernie supporter, likes Andrew Yang, wants universal health care. Like, maybe on some issues like hunting and guns, he may yeah. be slightly yeah. different. But, you he, know, he's a lot like us, I think. He's more like. He's just a critical thinker about certain things and has his own biases. And has like uh, – he, he doesn't fit perfectly in any – Correct. Trial. Right, yes. Correct. I think that's part of it. And he's distrustful of authority, I think. Yeah. That's his innate – yeah. Which, you know, <laughs> seems to be a core seems value be, around uh, here. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah. also getting yeah. there. I'm getting yeah. there. Um, I'm getting there too. I'm getting there. Uh, <laughs> um, so I – yeah. So I think the point he made to, to Sanjay Gupta I think is very apt, which is like don't you think it's a problem for your news wet work to lie? And he kept pressing him on that question. And I think it's a real big – I think he's really onto something, which is that if we are to trust any news source, we cannot have them fuel a culture war – and lie. I mean, yeah. CNN should have just said, uh, Joe Rogan, first of all, I don't know if he got vaccinated or not. I forget. He, I don't think he has. He's not admitted to being vaccinated. I see, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's another weird thing, which is like, I don't know, would everyone have to tell you what they did? I was right, like, I don't know. Right, I'm happy right. to let some people like, you're, you know, I don't want to know about everyone's vaccine status. Right, right, right. I'm, right. A, I'm a carding you at my at my dinner party. Exactly uh, right. <laughs> exactly. Because I'm confident the mind is working Because you're well. vaccinated, yeah, right. I'm confident I'm going to do fun. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, so I think they should have just said, you know, Joe Rogan took all these things. I think he took vitamin D and all these other things. Yeah, like, the, Z the Z-Pak, Z-Pak and, and prednisone and, prednisone and, and, and uh, ivermectin and yeah. And like I wouldn't prescribe any of those things, but sure, right. I mean, yeah. you know, he took it, but he didn't take horse paste. Right. And I think there's another irony, which is that many of the people who are like really dogging ivermectin um, I saw that one of them said that like, like you shouldn't prescribe it until there's like well-done randomized control trials. And I was like, weren't you the guy tweeting about masking two-year-olds last week? <laughs> I was like, so weren't you that like pro-masking two-year-old person? It's, so I was like, yeah, you should be running some randomized trials there too. Um, yeah, of course. Like we need to have like less uncertainty. Um, and then the other irony is that like in the beginning of the pandemic – People who were throwing hydroxychloroquine around like Skittles. Yeah, yeah. They were Harvard, one of the Harvard hospitals that was in their own protocol. And I tweeted like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Let the trial run. Don't put it in your protocol. And then I got pushed back from Harvard people that I know. They're like, you know, we, it has preclinic, it has in vitro evidence, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the same things they say about yeah, ivermectin yeah, now. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, come on, you were on the bandwagon of some unproven substance. We need some principles in medicine. The principles yeah. are. It's okay to have bioplausibility. You need to do randomized trials before you debut products with few rare exceptions. I think that's uh, not too much to ask for, but it has been during pandemic because this is an emergency, Vinay. All right? We got to just throw all the, the book at things, whether or not they cause harm or not. Wasn't there some data that like hydro, the hydroxychloroquine- yeah, it kills. It kills people. I think uh, Kat is, Catherine Axfiores and John Yonides have a meta-analysis showing increased death of mm. all the hydromectin randomized trials. So it probably killed people. Yeah. I think they estimated something like- Sorry, the hydro hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, in pooled meta-analytic estimate, it will it had increased mortality. Yeah. And I mean, cowboy medicine is never good. We all saw those news reports of like the doctor was like, oh, I just tossed on some TPA. I was right. like, you don't just toss yeah. on TPA. <laughs> like that's not the kind of drug- A little bit of a bleeding risk. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah, partner, little like, bit yeah, yeah, partner, yeah. just toss on some TPA. Come on. You know, I mean, oh, I don't know. You gonna slaughter a goat too? I mean, hey, come on. You know that's probably more effective because it creates a um, a placebo effect that's much more powerful. Maybe. Like someone brings a goat into my hospital room, I'm on a ventilator, I'm on like twenty of peep, I'm ready to like have barrow trauma. And you see, the you see a goat, they cut the goat, you, blood's everywhere, this guy's chanting. I'm gonna be like, 
damn, if this doesn't work. <laughs> You're like, turn down that peep. <laughs> yes. I'm ready for an SBT. Turn, yeah, turn Rest, down the peep. My <laughs> exactly. You got the guy from Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom. He's like ripped out a heart. <laughs> He's a shook today, Kalimar. By the way, that movie was so racist. Was so have, you, have you seen it recently? I, I haven't seen it recently, but I remember as a kid where people Just, were like, oh, is that what India's like? I was like, yeah, that's yeah, not what India's that, like. That's Come what on. My, I asked my dad, because we saw it together. I'm like, dad, I've been to India. I don't think it was like that. He's I like, didn't see the snake appetizer. Totally, yeah. totally. He's like, nobody's eating these snakes. Okay. <laughs> nobody's eating these bugs. What is this nonsense? He was so pissed, my dad was, when we saw it in the theater in 1984 or whatever. But now I watch it back and I'm like, no, the, the most racist component on that was Short Round, the little Vietnamese kid oh, who they pick it? up in, in, they pick him up in like Beijing or something. And, hey, Dr. Jones. You're like, dude, that, I don't know if that would play today. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I think a lot of these things would. Um... Would uh, Yeah. Well, the times change. It's just like we were saying, to bring it full circle. When you're young, you do some crazy stuff. The yeah. times change. I watched a comedy special from 2008. I won't even, I can't, I'll only tell you what it is off air. Um, and <laughs> and um, I was like, oh my God, yeah. every one of these jokes today yeah, would just. <laughs> I mean, if, I if, like, if, if Chappelle's getting canceled for the transgender stuff on the Netflix uh, special, dude, that stuff would get you like, I mean, if there was a jail for thought crimes, the guy'd be like getting life, <laughs> be in solitary. My gosh, I really. I don't know how comedians navigate these waters because I uh, guess, I don't know, I was thinking about comedy. This is a random thought. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you anyway. I was thinking about comedy and I was like, you know, like what is really good comedy is like uh, mediocre comedy is when you say the thing everyone's thinking but no one says. Right. But great comedy is when you say the thing that everyone hadn't yet thought about but they know is true and no one says. Yes. That's like the sweet spot of comedy. Yeah. When you're just like, you know, and you, you find an observation about life um, and- uh, and, and there's a surprise component because you're like, you, you feel an internal sense of connection and then you're surprised you've never thought of that. And that tr triggers the energetic release of laughter. So it's really quite a, a cascade that happens. And, and, and there's so much subtlety to it too. But like, are you aligned with this comedian? Like, have they already created this flow state? And are you in that path? Because how you deliver it then is different. So there's so much subtlety to it that I never, I've not studied it. It's just something that like, you know, I used humor as a way to uh, cope with um, you know, whatever bullying or feeling out of place in, you know, Clovis, California when I was growing up as mm -hmm. this weird kid. <laughs> you're, the, you're the little comedian. Yeah, I was a little like class clown guy. In fact, I was, I was our, our class clown. And uh, it's funny, the female, we had a male and a female class clown. The female class clown, I didn't even know who she was. Our high school was so big. I'm like, who the wow. hell are you? You're supposed to be funny. Like, let's have a funny off right now. Like immediately I was getting competitive. I'm like, come on. But it was all, it was all ego. It was all like trying to keep people under control by using comedy. If they're laughing, then you've, you're controlling the conversation type of thing. You know, you talk about Netflix and, you know, Squid Game was so popular. Ah, and yeah. I was supposed to tell you about it. I haven't it. seen yeah. it yet. I've watched like seven episodes. Ah, it's, so, it's dark, man. Oh, man. It's dark. Yeah. I mean, I guess the other drama that I think of, the Korean uh, best picture, Parasite. Parasite, yeah. Right. And then Squid Game, I think, follows. Uh, there's a lot of connections there in the sense that Squid Game is about people on the down and outs in society. They owe people money. They mm -hmm. borrow. They're gamblers. They're you know criminals. They're on the down and outs. And they're given this opportunity to essentially play uh, children's games, mm. except the penalty is death. Wow. And the prize is a lot of cash. But they're doing it because they're desperate and their mm. lives are broken. And I think what makes the show so good is that all of the um, the the games are literally the just very dark, very uh, you're you're very tense when you watch it. You don't know who's gonna live and who's gonna make it. Um, as well as the backstory of the characters are very heart wrenching, uh. and 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 it's really done really elegantly. But I think it's also telling that what does it say about America that we are so drawn to this narrative of like, and Parasite too, you know, when people are on the down and out of society, just how, what, what are desperate people willing to do? Mm. And we're just so captivated by these things, I think in part because many people are feeling very desperate. Feeling that thing. Des yeah. Well, you know, um, there's an anime that I watch with my kids called My Hero Academia. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's an interesting, so it's like a Harry Potter thing, but with heroes. So these kids who, in a society where like there are 80% of people have superpowers, like this mutation happened and people get superpowers. Some of them go on to just be cops and stuff or just like a doctor, or, like they have healing powers, but some of them decide they're gonna be superheroes. And so there's schools that, and 
the academy that they go to is like the Hogwarts. It's like the gold standard. So this little kid's born without any power. He has no, they call him quirks. So he's like, but he's always, he's like in love with like the lead superhero, this guy, All Might, who's like an American. Well, he's trained in America. So he's like, ha, 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 ha. Like his moves are like Detroit smash, but it's Japanese. You watch it in the Japanese with the American subtitle, English subtitle. Anyway, so long story short is, All Might, through a series of events, discovers this kid has this heart that just wants to help people. He's a true hero inside, bestows on him this power. And then he has to go through all his training. And so all the backstories of the villains even are these heart-wrenching, like, you're like, oh my God, this poor person. Oh, you have sympathy for the villains. Yeah, they're like a victim of their circumstance. And of course they would behave this way. If I were with them, I'd be doing the exact same thing. And so you have this general uh, sense of compassion, which is why the show's really good. Like, it, it compels adults. Like, I was like, oh, this is actually really good. Like, it's a true, like, uplifting, it's like a positive squid game. Yes, yes, yeah. positive squid What's so interesting, um, you know, I was recently asked to like give some lecture um, in, a, it's actually in another country via Zoom, and it was about like um, uh, implications of the pandemic like beyond health. Mm. And that led me to sort of a lot of thinking about like pandemic implications on democracy and things like that. And I, and I talked to this political scientist, uh, Vlad Kogan, who's been on my show many times about some of these things. Um, but I think like, I don't know, Squid Game, Parasite, the pandemic, I think it's clear that all the things that were there before have gotten a lot worse. Mm. Income inequality, wealth inequality, upward mobility, opportunity, um, schools. These are all ways that, this is like the most regressive response we've seen. Um, and that's things like, you know, people have pointed out on your show and, and many you know people have noticed. But I think the implications for um, society of the next 10 years are like non-trivial. And yeah. I don't know, I mean, what can the average person do? I think- that's something, I don't know, maybe worth saying, like one, um, you know, people you disagree with, you shouldn't hate, you mm. shouldn't want them dead, you, should, mm. you, know, you know, you should be a little bit more tolerant of ideas that you don't initially hold, you should maybe be a little bit less tribal, you should maybe do a little less signaling and a little more listening, mm. <laughs> you know, mm. and, you know, try to pe- meet people a little bit more in the middle. Um, the mandates, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, yeah, and Then yeah. I gotta go. Uh, yeah, yeah, oh yeah. We'll, we'll get lunch or something, but uh, oh, don't say that. Oh no, we'll get- we'll I mean, out. well, uh, uh, what? Uh, yeah, no. We always get recognized out here. No, you get recognized <laughs> and then people are like, oh, I think I know you. Uh, you get recognized, I don't get recognized. I prefer to it's keep my it neighborhood. Way. Prefer to keep, yeah, keep yeah. it that way. Um, um, <laughs> but what was I saying about- uh, Oh, you were talking about um, mandates. Mandates, oh yes. Yeah. I think, you know, I don't know. Um, I've written a lot about it. You've talked a lot about it. I mean, um, it's easy to be in the moment and think that this, the only goal in the world in the next 10 years is to get vaccine uptake high. And I think getting vaccine uptake high is a worthy goal. Yeah. We ought to do that. Yeah. Now, the moment you start introducing mandates and firing people from jobs and kicking out healthcare workers who have been working in the pandemic, even when they were unvaccinated, taking a lot of risk on their own shoulders, um, you start to... It, things will cut both ways. I mean, it's clear that these mandates have increased the fraction of people who got vaccinated because a lot of people don't cannot afford to lose their job. Mm. That's why they're getting vaccinated. Um, some people have quit over it, you know, mm. a non-trivial percentage of people, 1% or something. But in a lot of hospitals, like, they are the glue that keeps things going. Like, we need those people. You know, things are, like, not as good in clinics because they're gone. Um, and a lot of people are, are dropping out of the labor force for lots of reasons that we don't even know. Like, their desires have changed, et cetera. Mm. Um, but I do think that one of the consequences of the up, of the mandates is what will it do for vaccine uptake? But another consequence is it what will it do to how people vote in the future? Um, it the left has aligned itself with these mandates. They've aligned themselves with you know strong masking recommendations. I think we will see in the Virginia election next week. Like, will they pay a price for that in the polls? And we'll see in twenty twenty two, and we'll see in twenty twenty four if they'll pay a price for these things. And I think it's easy to go on social media and feel like you have the finger on the pulse of what people think, but there is, all the polls are getting more and more inaccurate. There's a lot of preference falsification. Like people are unwilling to admit how they really feel about some things. And I think I have a lot of reason to feel a little bit nervous about what people are, I don't know, what do people really think? And will they vote? How will they vote next time? Well, you know, it'll be a good wake up call, uh, I think for people who feel a certain way about where the world ought to go. And they find that, oh, they've actually been voted out of- Hashtag zero COVID has been voted into the garbage can. Exactly right, right. exactly right. You know, lockdowns and all of that. And uh, I I think it's it's, it's good, it's good. I think, what I actually think, and this is a good way to end all this maybe, is that 
there are a lot of people who are waking up a little to like, hey, what is this all about? Like, why am I even doing this rat race of a job that yes, I hate? Yes, yes. And a lot of these guys are in healthcare because healthcare is a shit show yes. for a lot of people. And uh, because it, it, again, systemically it's terrible. So they, they're good people want to do the right thing. Maybe they're even called to that profession, but boy, it's just been impossible to you know, when, when you said earlier, hey, what's my best day? What do I really like? You, your dinner party, right? I think about that in healthcare something. Well, what's my best day as a hospitalist? Oh, it's when the paperwork is minimum. There's a team of really smart people that we, we're pushing and pulling on each other. We're supported by a larger team. We have time to spend with the patients and we have the tools, resources, and autonomy to do our job. And then that that is liberating. Then your sense of moral elevation. You're like, my God, this is, I was called to do this. This is beautiful. So there are a lot of people who've not seen that much at all in yeah. their work and yeah. they're like enough yeah i think um like one narrative is like healthcare workers are quitting because they had to care for covid patients i think that's true in a lot of cases but another narrative is they're quitting because they realize that a lot of this stuff has been force fed to us yeah. i'll tell you one thing i got a lot of emails about when we talked about it that i did read some uh was about that letting people die alone part yeah um that had happened a lot and still kind of happens a little bit and a lot of doctors wrote to me saying that like they they knew it was wrong. They didn't want to enforce those rules, yeah. but the hospital administrators made yeah, them do it. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh Ooh, man. man. I was like, you know, I guess I would say there's like nothing worse than like the, imagining being a doctor and someone tells you some stupid rule yeah. that you know is just morally wrong. Garbage. Garbage. Yeah. And you have to, and you're like, don't even feel like you have the power to, like medicine needs to be a field where that doctor should have the power to crush that rule yeah. and do whatever they want yeah. for the best interest of their patient. Right. And well, if it's not that field, it's not run by the right people. That, that's the moral injury of it, you know? And, and, and the idea that again, tools, resources, autonomy, <clears throat> they don't have autonomy. Like, oh no, this is terrible for the patient. It's terrible for the family. It's gonna create psychic wounds. Yes. It's unethical. It's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. Like we have the PPE, like why are we doing this? Oh, because, you know, Billy Bob, the administrator. Some risk averse risk bureaucrat. The, the ri risk management in the hospitals, like, it's the whole reason I don't have 20 more music videos. That hospitals have shut down my ability to film in them because they're risk management departments. Well, like, not well, if you were a YouTube influencer student. <laughs> oh, yeah, they, yeah, right? <laughs> if you're like a young college, you, you know, just med school YouTube influencer. I'll just, I'll just say real quick. So, yeah. you know, Zubin got me like to actually do some videos and um, because I had been in the podcast stuff. And, and I, you're crushing it, by no, the way. I don't, well, it I don't looks know. great. It sounds great. It's I, wonderful. It's a work in progress. He's the one who knows all the, all the, all the, all the little errors on it. But, but one thing I was curious was, I was like, well, you know, uh, like what content is out there that I will be interested in? So right. I was like, you know, what are the other doctors putting out? I want to watch something where some doctor talks about some drug or some product in neurology or whatever that I might find interesting. So I'm looking for that. I ask people for recommendations and I've got like um, a bunch of, you know, younger people on my team, uh, research team. And then they like, oh, watch this channel, watch this channel, watch this. Channel. And I guess the more I started like going on this rabbit hole, of like what is the medical content of YouTube? It is literally like hundreds and hundreds of med students. By the way, is this the new loan forgiveness program? Medical <laughs> students have to become like film their whole lives and post it on YouTube. But there are hundreds of medical students. They film like life as a medical student student they're filming like i don't know some people are filming as their residents on shifts and stuff and i was like listen if you're a resident on a shift forget about the camera focus on the pa focus, focus on, on the, the patient. patient focus on the patient you can't be getting the camera around what are you doing and the medical students filming like their day um and by the way they're they're like doing a much better job than than i was as a student aka waking up late and like you know like yeah. i'm not doing all the meal prep for the week etc and all these things <laughs> but um i don't know i was just like i don't know i feel like, uh, it's a dis, I don't know. I guess it's, it's a dis. It's this theater again. Like, you know, I, I, I'll be honest, if I were, if this had existed when I was a medical student, I would absolutely have done this because I was that type of histrionic theatrical person in those days. And I needed my ego to be expanded by other people knowing that I'm in medical school at UCSF working really hard and here's my day. Our channels wouldn't have been that popular because we're not that good looking. That's true. <laughs> That's the main thing. <laughs> I would have been like, oh, 200 followers. I know. Oh, oh. <laughs> and then, and uh, they're all and, other guys. I know. Like, and there's my mom watching it. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Mom, and I was like, oh, I love totally. your, loved your video. You should yeah. eat better. Um, yeah, oh, exactly. I, I get that I, now. I, I don't know if I do it because like it's a, I don't know, it takes away your time. And when you're not, I don't know, you should be immersing yourself in the, uh, yeah. I'm, this could sound so bad. Uh, okay. What do I think? Um, 
One, you should be immersing yourself in what it means to be a doctor. And that isn't just studying the stupid things they make you study. Yeah. It's also really learning about medicine in a deep way, a rich way, reading beyond what they've asked you to read. And that should kind of be your focus because when you join a profession, a guild for the first time, there's a period of time where you are really sort of a Swiss army knife. You can learn and cut and sew and do all sorts of things that you will, that eventually your like mind will gel. And like, I, I don't have the innovative ideas I had when I was 26 or 27. I remember right. learning a little bit about biomedicine, but still having a lot of open questions. And I think that's like a really ripe creative period mm. um, in any profession. I think they're missing out on some of that when they come home and must edit these videos for in godly amount of time to put all those stuff, you know, you know, I, I, we don't edit our videos, but like, I can imagine if you edit. Yeah, we don't edit. We just we, put them out. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, 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 <laughs> it's because we're lazy, really. Yeah, really. <laughs> and also that's one. And the second thing I worry about is like, I don't know, if you come, if you turn your whole life into a commodity for others to like judge, what does that do to yourself as a person? If you turn your grief into a commodity to sell to other people, what does that do to your grief? It poisons these emotions. These are deep-seated human things that, like, they're not meant to be given away. Um, ah, and it's an external locus of control you've given away. Now, what they think of me is my self-worth. Yeah, and why right. do you, I don't well, know, they, I, what do they I, need to... I'm I'm my hardest critic as it is. I don't need anyone else criticizing me, <laughs> like, to actually feel it. Like, you know what I mean? So that kind of thing, I think, We've got to, at some point we need to have a national intervention on that and just say, you know what? Get back to work. Get back to work. You know, when you have something to say, come out and say it. I, by all means, I want doctors on YouTube teaching. Right, like, yeah, yeah that's, what, that's what I want to say. Like, yes, like, I, there are many issues that are real and legitimate that they may think about. And when you think about it, articulate it, formulate it, discuss it with your peers when you're ready, put that out there. Yeah. But I don't want to know about how you make your coffee and I don't care about how you cook the chicken for the week. You know, like what is, and I was just like, and what is this? And I, and what are you spending all this time on this? I mean, their target audience must be people who are trying to get into medical school and want to see what it's like. But the truth is, you know, and I had that person in real life. You know, your parents. The, my parents was one, yeah. although I tried to ignore anything they taught me, right? You know, so, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to be like my parents. But there was this guy, this Indian kid. He was a second year at UCSF. I'm not going to say his name. And he shows up one day. I'm at Berkeley. He's a friend of one of my housemates. I was pre med, but I didn't really know what that meant. And I was also music. And I'm like, I'm going to be a rock star. And this guy shows up and he's crazy and he's got crazy hair and he's Indian. He's like a swami. He's smoking a ton of weed and he's like growing weed in his room. And I'm like, who is this guy? And he's like, let me tell you about medical school and he just he just data dumps and i'm like this guy he hates authority he questions everything he thinks most of what we do doesn't work he's at one of the top med schools in the world he's really smart but also crazy i want to be him it's like that's that me. was your inspiration that was my inspiration and i'm like if he can do it i can do it and it was true and one of the advice yeah. he gave me, he's like, finish in three years because it shows that you can actually oh, handle the work. Well, finish college. Wow. So that day I was like, how can I arrange my credits? And I finished in three years. And so those kind of influences were, now it's like some YouTube, you know what you need to do? Create a meal plan. Yes, and right. then you need to organize Use your life. Use the cards. Use these flash, what, I don't know what these fucking flash cards, are. sorry, I don't know what these flash cards are. <laughs> these flash cards, we didn't have no flash cards. You, 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 do, you read the book, you put it in your brain. <laughs> There's no flash card, There's no flash card. This is flash card. And, and now it's just fear of missing out. Like you see this perfect student doing everything perfect. They eat better than I eat. I don't oh, have time hell for yeah. I don't even eat breakfast for lunch. I have a, a wild king salmon that yeah, I've gently no. braised with virgin olive oil <laughs> extracted from the teat of a mountain goat and I'm like, how did that happen? Let me just say one thing about medicine, which I think that they all miss, which is like, I don't know. I was like, you know what? No offense to the trainees, but um, <laughs> you, you don't know what it's like to practice medicine when you're a student. You don't know what it's like to practice medicine as a resident. You don't know what it's like to practice medicine as a fellow. You really only kind of get a sense of practicing medicine when you're like five or six years into a job. Yeah. And I'll tell you what practicing medicine means. It is not a memorization business. Mm. You have memorized a lot of facts and you'll be surprised at how many facts are in the back of your mind that every once in a while they come up and you're like, oh my God, I hadn't thought about that in 15 years or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's one. Two, what it really is about, it's about like, I don't know, working on the craft of talking to someone and figuring out who they are, what they are, what they believe, what they value, what risks they'll take, what concerns them, what doesn't concern them, what they want out of life, and what bothers them, and what they're hoping for in the treat. Like you're trying to get figure out who this person is, and then you're trying to figure out what is of all the things in in in, in Western medicine, which is this like incomplete, fragmented view of the body that is still in a thousand years from now is going to look antiquated. Of all the things we have, what are the sort of labels and diagnoses and and categories we can kind of take these complaints and put them in? How parsimonious 
obviously, can we fit that? Then what are all the therapies we have? What is the delta effect of those therapies, which may be subject to bias and misinterpretation? And how might those help the person or hurt the person? How do they comport with their values and preferences? And finally, what's the kind of treatment plan you would recommend for this person knowing who they are? What are the options you'd give them? What are the kind of w- ways you'd counsel them to walk through these choices? And and then the agony. Then you're at home at night. You wake up at two in the morning and you're thinking about that person. And did you forget to think about this or that? Are you thinking about the person that you lost to follow up and where they are in their life or the person you cured of Hodgkin's lymphoma never came back to your clinic or the person who died and you wonder what you could have done? And that is medicine. It's like this all-consuming human endeavor that is like probably the most beautiful job there is. And it is not what they're posting in their little videos. That's not even close to the act of medicine, I think. Fuck. <laughs> so that's my, that's my man. Opinion. I think you pretty much just summed up what it, what this all means for us, you know, as doctors, that's what it is. And if you, if you listen to that, I'm going to pull that rant out and put it, put it out by itself, because if you can listen to that and you feel that right deep there, you should go into medicine or you should stay in medicine. If you don't, if you're like, no, that's not for me, abandon it now. Like go do anything else you're interested in. And the only thing I'll add to it is that, and if anyone tells you something, you need to like have this like pit bull tenacity to get to the bottom of the fact, interrogate the fact, question the fact, probe the fact until you come to yourself, believe it deeply mm. or reject it outright. So in other words, think for yourself. Think for yourself. Yeah, that's all middle in a nutshell. Dude. All right. Huh, we went like 30 longer minutes than longer than we yeah. were going to. So this right. is great. Yeah. Oh man, it's yeah. always a joy, dude. Uh, Pleasure. Damn. Haters gonna hate. <laughs> Let them hate and watch the money pile up. <laughs> <laughs> That's not really the mantra it's of my a, life, but uh, it's fifty cents mantra. No, I see. I to see. me, I'm an optimist. He's half dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Guys, I love you. Check out Vinay's channel. How do we find you on YouTube? I guess it's at my name at Vinay Prasad MDMPH. Perfect. Or just search Vinay uh, Prasad, and you'll. I'm sure you're the main guy that'll show up. <laughs> and his, dude, his YouTube channel is awesome. And I'm going to take full credit yeah, for it. You 100%. Should, you should get full credit. You pushed me to do it. Yeah, except he actually does it better than I do it. It's amazing. Um, and then share the video. Uh, support the show if you want to or don't. Uh, I love you guys. More love. More love in the world. Less assumption of, of evil and more discourse. Okay, guys. We out. Peace. Thanks, man.